This video is on heredity, so we have quite a bit uh, to get into here. So it will include uh, DNA and RNA, meiosis and mitosis, alleles, and uh, included in that will be recessive and dominant traits, and then we'll get into uh, Punnett squares and how to do those. So um, looks like we got four questions to consider as we're going through this video. Um, the difference between phenotype and genotype uh, that's definitely important for uh, your exam uh, what is the hereditary material in humans called um, what must occur in order for a recessive trait to be present in offspring and difference between meiosis and mitosis okay all right so dna is the hereditary material in humans and almost all other organisms so right away uh, we already got one of our questions knocked out right there right um, that second bullet point the hereditary material in humans is called blank there we go DNA um, genes are factors that control traits genes are the units of hereditary and are a locus or region of DNA they determine what traits are expressed in individuals. So being able to know in a couple sentences what genes are, that's important. Um, jumping back into DNA here. DNA controls the cell's production of proteins. DNA is shaped as a double helix, which looks like a twisted ladder. Right? And so as you were looking at these two, that twisted ladder that we see over on the right side, right? that's DNA, that's the double helix, where the single ladder that we see on the left side is a representation of RNA. So each rung of the ladder is made up of a pair of nitrogen bases. There are four bases, and again we're talking about DNA here, which are adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. Uh, and they always pair with each other in specific ways. Adenine always pairs with thymine. Guanine always pairs with cytosine. The sides of the latter are made up of a pentose sugar and phosphate. This combination, a pentose sugar, a phosphate group, and the nitrogen base makes a nucleotide. Okay, and so we can kind of jump into these. Uh, nucleotides bind together in specific patterns to form the genetic code that defines a given trait. RNA is essential in various biological roles in coding, decoding, regulation, and expression of genes. In order for a protein to be expressed, it first needs to be transcribed by messenger RNA. This messenger RNA is translated into a protein by ribosomes. And then finally with codons, uh, a codon codes for an amino acid. The amino acids are linked together as translation takes place, a group of three DNA letters makes up one codon. Okay, meiosis and mitosis. We need to be able to recognize the difference between these two. Most of the body cells are produced through mitosis, which is a process of cell replication that results in two identical daughter cells from a single parent. The number of chromosomes remains the same as the parent, which is 46. This is a diploid cell. Meiosis, on the other hand, results in four cells with each containing a single copy of each chromosome, which is a haploid. Meiosis is a type of cell division that reduces the number of chromosomes in the parent cell by half and produces four gamete cells. This process is required to produce egg and sperm cells for sexual reproduction okay and so that's just something you need to be familiar with that does one of our questions did focus in there on meiosis and mitosis and being able to recognize the difference in their types of cell division okay, as we jump into alleles so alleles are different forms of a gene linked to specific characteristics when two different alleles are inherited for a trait, but only one allele is expressed, 
that allele is called the dominant allele. The allele, the allele that is not expressed is recessive. Uh, if the alleles are alike, that person is homozygous for that particular gene. If the alleles are different, that person is heterozygous for that particular gene. And that should be pretty easy to remember, right? Homo meaning same, hetero meaning different. If both alleles are the dominant allele, the gene is called homozygous dominant. If both alleles are recessive, the gene is called homozygous recessive. If the alleles are different, it's heterozygous for the gene. Okay, so those are uh, definitely important terms to know that you will be tested on. Uh, a recessive trait is expressed only if the offspring has two copies of the recessive allele. Okay, so that's important, and I believe we probably have a question on that. What? So that third bullet point there. What must occur in order for a recessive trait to be present in offspring? Two copies of the recessive allele. Okay, so that's an important one uh, that you definitely need to know. And then on the other hand, a dominant trait will be expressed even if only one recessive allele is present. Okay, so as we jump into uh, phenotype versus genotype, which also I think is one of our questions. We'll go back and look at it in a second here. Um, but knowing the difference, phenotype refers to a trait's physical appearance based on an organism's genetic code. Environment, environmental factors can also play a role. But the genotype is the part of the genetic makeup of the cell, and therefore of an organism or individual, which determines a specific characteristic of that cell or of the organism individual. Okay, and so as they were asking us, most likely it's what is the question will be, what is the difference between a phenotype and a genotype, right? And so again, the phenotype refers to a trait's physical appearance. Uh, the genotype is the part of the genetic makeup of a cell. Okay, let's go back here. So that's the end of what we need to know for alleles. Okay, Punnett squares. The Punnett square is a square diagram, as you can see here, that is used to predict the genotypes of a particular cross or breeding experiment. It is used to predict the probability of the offspring having a particular genotype. To make a Punnett square, start by drawing a box that's divided into four equal squares. And you can see this on the screen, right? We have four equal squares. Uh, what we do next is label the row the rows with one parent's genotype and the columns with the other parent's genotype. After that, label each square, starting with the letter to the left of the square, followed by the letter above the square. And so you can see what we've done there, right? So in this case, we have, a, when we see cap those two capital Gs, those are both dominant. We see those two lowercase Gs, those are both recessive. Right? And then, so we have one dominant and one recessive within each square in the Punnett square. So a classic example is parents who have, uh, they're both, they both have brown eyes with heterozygous genotypes, right? And so when we say heterozygous genotypes, that would mean there's uh, one dominant and one recessive. And so that would be expressed as capital B and then lowercase b. So in this case, we need to know that brown eyes are dominant over blue eyes. And usually the question would be, what is the probability that uh, these two are going to have a blue-eyed child? So if you fill in uh, a Punnett square, you'll get uh, capital B, capital B, right? So two dominant, capital B, lower B, capital B, lowercase b, and then two lowercase b's, with the two lowercase b's being recessive. So the likelihood of getting those two recessive Bs is 1 in 4, or 25%, and that's the chance that you have the blue-eyed child. Or, as another example, say that you know that the father has curly hair and is homozygous dominant, right? So that would be if uh, capital C, capital C, homozygous dominant. In such a case, no matter the genotype of the mother, his offspring will always have at least one dominant allele, 
and thus will have curly hair. So this is to say that the probability of his having a curly hair child is 100%. You could easily see a question like that on the exam. Uh, alternately, if an ind individual has blue eyes, which again is a recessive trait, we know that the father and mother each have at least one recessive allele, right? Okay, oops, too far. And then we can jump back into the questions, right? So based on everything that we've done, we should be able to answer these four questions. So this is a great time to hit that pause button, see if you can answer the questions. If you struggle with them, go back into the video because we've answered each of these four in this video.